Welcome everybody to the 19th Glasgow Azure user group. Thank you so much for supporting us virtually. I know it's slightly different um, virtually as opposed to our in-person meetups, but hopefully we can keep this community going and sharing of knowledge while we are all in lockdown and dealing with um, the current situation globally. You'll probably know me, my name is Sarah Lean. I am the founder and organiser of the Azure User Group and we've also got Gregor on the organising committee as well who's also here tonight. Um, and a huge big thank you to all of our sponsors for continuing to give us their support, especially during this current situation. So um, a big shout out to all of them and massive thank you to them for their continued and, and longevity of support. Tonight we have two sessions. We are going to have April Edwards from Microsoft um, deliver a session first of all and then secondly we have Richard and Mark from our sponsors F5 and they'll be talking about Nginx. We're going to finish off with our traditional quiz and the winner will get a Logitech mouse and a Razer mouse map. So super um, useful probably with us all working from home. So that is our evening and I'm going to hand over to April. Thank you. So I will try and answer questions down in the in the chat comments, but I do encourage everyone. That's why I do encourage everyone to chime in because it is it is actually really hard to speak, see, read comments, and answer coherently. Um, it's probably my downfall, but yeah. Right. Welcome everyone. I want to welcome you to storing your data in Azure. So I am April Edwards. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. What does that mean? Uh, I work with the build with code with team. So I go into customers around the world and help them deploy their applications and uh, transition their applications from on-premise into the cloud. Uh, my team is a cloud native team. So we do a lot of containerization with Kubernetes. Um, and my background is from data center modernization. So I do everything kind of from, I've done everything in the past from kind of the outside hardware stack all the way into the application stack. So kind of full, literally end to end. Um, so you can always find me on Twitter, ping me questions uh, or LinkedIn as well. So when we get started, every time I do a talk, I can usually tell what country I'm in, uh, but I like to do a little bit of a interactive thing. So if you could get out your phones or you can do it on your laptops, whatever device you're logged into and go to mentimeter.com. And you're gonna enter in the code 464211 and that'll be the, the entry code. So the first question is going to be, what is your job title? And while you guys are doing that, I will answer um, my my favorite beer selection is from a local brewery. So uh, Windsor Neaton Brewery is right around the corner from my house. So very important. Very important question. So as we see, start seeing what everyone's job title is here, we're gonna see um, a various array of, of job titles. So we have you know, cloud administrators, uh, infrastructure managers, dev, ops teams, uh, architects. Um, the reason why I really like talking about storage and, and data in Azure is because everything we're gonna, we do in, in our systems has data, produces data, and we, we need to consume some type of storage. So this is a really important topic, I think, for a lot of people. So it's always good to see a, a variety in the audience. Um, very rarely have I given a talk or spoken to a group of people where it's been like one type of person, maybe at a customer site where I have all their devs in the room or all their ops teams in a room. Um, and it's a little bit harder, actually, because you need to involve all those teams in your organization. So it's really good to see. Everyone uh, here. Cool. I think we got everyone in there. The next question is, what is your favorite animal? Um, this one's just a fun one. Uh, <laughs> but this is generating data, right? We all have different preferences, and everything we're doing is generating data on the back end. So uh, this is just a little bit of a fun one. Um, mine's a shark. Um, honey badger is a good one. Honey badger don't care is one of my favorite phrases. So yeah, so we're just generating better data. And usually when I do this one as well, I always ask people what they prefer, tea or coffee. And in the UK, that's a popular one. Usually tea usually wins out, but I put a third one in where I usually put beer because I think beer is more important. Um, cool. So yeah, so we can see we're generating data. We can see what people are doing. So it's good to have a really nice wide and varied audience going on tonight. So I'm just gonna move out of that and get back into what we're gonna talk about. So we're going to focus on storage in Azure specifically tonight. Uh, we're, first thing we're going to talk about is why cloud storage? Um, what's what's the compelling reason to go there and, and why would we even do it? So for a lot of you today, you may not be in Azure or your organizations may not fully be in the cloud. So there's that compelling reason of concerns and, and, and why we would look to do that. Uh, the next thing we're going to speak about 
is uh, the introduction to cloud storage options. So we're going to go over all the different types of storage options. And, you know, hopefully you get introduced to some ones you've never heard before. And we're going to look at some ways we can also uh, deploy those and do something differently. So my first demo, we're going to deploy a data store in the Azure portal, but we're going to go above and beyond that. So it's not going to be just a data store. So this is a good way to just see how it's done and maybe some other things and other features that are built in. Next up, we're going to talk about Cosmos DB. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Cosmos and some of the features. And I'm going to show you some of the things we can do with Cosmos DB as well um, and how it replicates across uh, the globe. And then we're going to cover off a little bit about SQL Server, Postgres, and MySQL in Azure. And then we're going to go into Azure Data Factory and SQL Data Warehouse. So let's get going now. And we can go into Storage in Azure and start covering off the basics. So why cloud storage? Uh, you know, whenever I meet with a customer or end user and we're talking about, you know, why are they going to move to the cloud? What's the compelling reason? And a lot of customers are still quite early doors with the cloud and they're sitting on premise today and they have so many questions around why they would why they would even start going down that path. And, and there's two things I, I talk about with every customer to help to talk to them about why cloud storage, why it's such a compelling reason. The first one is reliability. So what's the performance of their data going to be? Let's answer those questions. What's my data going to look like? What's the latency of my data? What's my availability of my data going to be in the cloud? Uh, the next thing I talked to a lot of customers about is security. Every customer wants to know how secure is my data? Where's it going to be located? What vulnerabilities am I exposing myself and my organization to? And we start answering all those questions and we start addressing them. And we're going to address those further on in this talk as well. Um, but I think the biggest and most compelling reason why we look at cloud storage is because it takes off that operational burden, your day-to-day -day burden that you have as maybe a, a storage administrator or someone that needs to manage the data that your applications are producing or that you're an infrastructure manager and you have to be concerned about how much data you have uh, day to day and the performance of that data. So I want to look at Azure at a glance and I really like the slide because it's, it's kind of a 10,000 foot view of what we offer in Azure and I'm sure all of you are aware of a lot of the services and you go into the marketplace and you see so many different types of services that you can consume. Um, how many of you have a, smart have a smart device like a watch? Probably quite a few of you. Um, we probably have smart devices in our homes um, as well. Those are going to be all of our edge devices. And we offer some uh, Microsoft ones as well. So we have Azure Stack, the Azure Data Box, Azure Sphere, uh, Connect, and the HoloLens. And those are all those edge devices. Um, and those all connect in and consume data, right? They're bringing data to the cloud. And we also provide you with a lot of tools in which to um, manipulate your data and connect to your data. So we have things like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, GitHub, Power Apps, and Power BI. And these tools enable us to, to really get into that data and manipulate what we're doing with our applications and everything that comes around it. But the stuff in the middle here is our serverless uh, offering that we have in Azure. And this is really the value proposition in the cloud. A lot of customers look at moving their virtual machines over and seeing what they could do with it. But the value proposition is in that serverless space because we take off that operational burden of the operating system and say, consume a service, or consume a managed service with an SLA and how we can do it better. Focus on your code, focus on your data. So we have things like web apps, we have mobile, mobile databases, analytics, AI, machine learning, and lots of IoT opportunities for customers. And what's interesting is when we start talking about serverless, the reality is there's an underpinning infrastructure underneath that, no matter what. So there's still, when we talk about like platform as a service with web apps, we have compute that we have to talk about. We still have to talk about networking and security. And then how do we connect to these? How do we use our identity in the cloud? And you know, we talk a lot about Azure Active Directory and Active Directory and that authentication mechanism. So all these things are still the kind of that foundation of the house we build in the cloud. And underpinning all of that is storage. Now, storage consumes everything we, we, we do. Um, everything we do, on whether it be on our machine or in our systems, consumes some type of storage. And I will tell you, there is no bad day like a storage bad day. So let me give you a little bit of a story. Um, I was working for a company in the U.S. many years ago, and I was running an IT infrastructure for them, for a retail division of a very, very large company. Um, I went on a 10-day holiday, and it was amazing. I turned off my phone, no laptop, no connectivity to the outside world. Uh, I flew back home. Uh, walked right in my office on the Monday morning and I ran into my manager. And my manager at the time was like this very military guy, very tough, very strong. And he had been crying and his eyes were completely bloodshot. And I was like, are you OK? And he's like, no, no, we've lost everything. And we had we had lost everything everything in our data center, all of our tier one applications. We lost Exchange. We lost Citrix. We lost SharePoint. Um, we literally lost everything. We lost connectivity to everything. Uh, we had a complete data outage. We had a <laughs> we had a meltdown of our systems in our SAN. So I spent the next 72 hours at my desk. People were bringing me food and coffee to get our systems back online. And we had to rebuild a lot of things from scratch. And that was a bad few days for me. 
And that was the turning point in my career. When my company said, we want to look at this thing called Office 365 and migrate our, our mailboxes to the cloud. That's when I really started looking at the cloud and what value it could bring. It meant no more 3 a.m. calls, no more 72 hour long days. That was my turning point in my career. So let's talk about the modern data state. Um, most customers today are, are looking to move to the cloud and they're in a hybrid model. I don't know any customer that doesn't have multiple data centers or the data in multiple locations. And it could be in multiple clouds like GCP and AWS. We see that a lot day in and day out. So we need to normalize that experience of our tools and how we automate and how we embrace the cloud. So customers really need three things when they're moving to the cloud. First thing is they need to work across their data cleanly from anywhere. And they need to you know, connect to it with things like R or Python, et cetera. They need to be able to access their data lakes and data warehouses from anywhere in the world. They need flexibility and choice in how they deploy their data, whether they're going to virtual machines or containers and deploying whatever code it might be, Java, or maybe they need to run a whole Linux environment. They need access to that in their environments and they need that choice. And then security and performance is going to be absolutely critical. I don't speak to one customer that doesn't bring up security and performance every single time. They need security in the cloud to be as good or better than what they have on premise today. Azure has more certifications than any other cloud. And we enable customers to bring any language, any platform, anywhere. And that's what we achieve to do. So what is the difference of running Azure data storage versus on-premises storage? What are, what are some of the benefits and some of the differences? So let's talk about cost effectiveness, because at the end of the day, when we look to our organizations and say, right, we want to implement some system, there's going to be a cost. So we need to talk about that. So on-premise requires dedicated hardware, which needs to handle your peak demand. So when you know you're, if your organization is a seasonal business or you know you peak once a month, you have to handle those systems. You have to have that built, ready to go and invest in that capital every single time from day one and be ready to handle that peak demand. You need everything hot and ready to go. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, I need this, I'll just order some storage, it'll be there tomorrow. That isn't that isn't a cap that isn't an opportunity that you have with an on-premise environment. So Azure data storage is gonna be pay as you go and scalable. So everything we're gonna look at today is gonna be completely scalable. So we're ready for those on-demand fluctuations. So let's talk about reliability. On-premise, you need things like backup and load balancing, disaster recovery. And in my story, you know, we had backup, we were load balanced and we had a DR plan, but it wasn't great. But we 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 had never exercised our DR plan till that day and it and it all failed. So those are things that became priority one critical to the business that we talked about before, but no one really enacted. And we kind of thought, oh, we kind of have it covered. Everything in Azure Data Storage is going to provide these services built into service out of the box. So when you start consuming, we can absolutely enable it moving forward. Let's talk about storage types. You know, on your on-premise environment, you need to support different types of storage options, uh, removing the need to maybe configure different types of servers and administrative software and an on-premise server environment to handle all that as well. That's a lot of overhead. Uh, in the cloud, it's all managed from that same single control plane. We have other tools you can hook into it as well to see your data and leverage that even further. So let's talk about an Azure storage account in the cloud. So if you haven't deployed an Azure storage account before, um, we're just going to define it as a logical construct. That's all a storage account is. It is literally a wrapper that we're going to put around some type of storage, and it's going to provide us an endpoint into that storage. We can have private endpoints or we can have public endpoints, and we can control access to those. So the first type of storage we're going to talk about is blob storage. That's binary large object storage. This is great for storing like you know, large files, unstructured data, and kind of your backup and, and restore vol volumes that you might have. Uh, a blob can handle up to eight terabytes of data and it can it can be tiered as well. So you can have hot storage, cold storage, and even archives, archive storage as well um, in those storage tiers. So if you've ever um, looked at maybe how your backup or DR plans are working today, you can backup from on-premise or uh, use any Azure backup or um, Azure site recovery for your DR software and replicate that into the cloud. And that gets stored on blob storage. And if any of you are using any third party tools like Veeam or uh, Zerto, they'd use the exact same thing. It is their interface, but it's just Azure storage on the back end. It just holds those large, um, basically, um, volumes of data from your, from your replications in those blobs. Next up we have is file storage. Um, Azure file storage supports SMB and REST protocols, and, and it's all in the cloud. And it's going to support Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems. So it's pretty versatile. It's great for, um, for document sharing. And we also have a product called Azure File Sync that allows you to sync from your on-premise file server into Azure. 
Um, I've actually worked with a lot of customers that might have multiple sites, um, especially here in the UK, customers that might have remote sites. Um, I had customers specifically with like about 35, 38 remote sites. Each of those sites had a single point in failure, a point of failure uh, file server on that site. So they're ac accessing it and then they were replicating back to their data centers and then taking copies of that data and then replicating it to their other data center for their DR plan. And they're having a lot of management overhead to make this work. So what we did is we enacted um, Azure files in the cloud with Azure file sync from those sites. So everything went to the single source of truth in the cloud. We created redundancy in the storage account and then they could access their data um, from, from the local site. If they lost access to the local site, they could then redirect everyone to the cloud storage. So they automatically have it back up, less overhead maintenance, and it saved a lot of time. Um, and we do have a lot of customers that have a file server on-premise today that look to replicate it into Azure. Um, if you think of DFS, uh, Azure File Sync is like DFS, but actually works a lot better. If you've ever worked with DFS, are uh, breaking, yeah, you'll probably have remember that not being always the most reliable. Azure File Sync works on different protocol, but does that same type of replication. Next up, we have Azure Queue Storage. Um, and this is great for storing large numbers of messages that can be accessed any anywhere in the world. Each message can be about uh, up to about 64 kilobytes in size, and you can have multiple senders and multiple subscribers. Um, we use queue storage a lot when we're kind of ingesting data. So I have a customer that had their application loaded into a data center, built on a bunch of virtual machines, and they want to move to the cloud. And in that, we transformed their application from an IaaS environment uh, in, a, in a data center into a completely serverless solution. And what we did is we put Azure queue storage on the front, and they were ingesting data from a device. Um, we'll just say vehicles, right? So if you think about you're trying to ingest data at single point, it must have a timestamp on that incoming data. Um, we put Azure queue storage on the front of it, and that's what we use to transact that data uh, into the whole serverless um, uh, architecture, basically. So that was really great. Next up we have is Azure Tables. And this is our NoSQL way of storing data. This is basically a key value store. You can store hundreds of terabytes of data into a table uh, itself. And if you need to consume petabytes of data, you can shard that data to get that, to get that kind of uh, consumption. Uh, Q st uh, table storage is going to be strongly consistent, highly dynamic, uh, and load balanced as well, which is great. It can handle very, very high transaction rates, and it's very cost efficient. We see customers use table storage if maybe they're starting off a new project in their organization and they don't want to commit to a database technology. They're not sure where to go. They might start in the table storage. So as the project grows, they can consume in that, and it's a very cost effective way to proceed on that. So I'm going to take um, a guess here. I've by show of hands or people want to chime in and say, yes, how many of you have built a virtual machine before? Yep. Yep. Built on thousands. <laughs> yes. So if you built a virtual machine, you will have seen Azure disk storage. Um, these are exactly what you attach to a virtual machine. So if you built a VM, you'll know that they come in multiple performance tiers. You can mix and match the price with the performance as well. So you have options of like flash drives, SSD, SAS. And when you attach them to a VM, you can you can mix and match those based off the type of the virtual machine you're deploying. So if the virtual machine supports um, super fast SSDs, you can absolutely set those in. So you might have a VM that requires, you know, nothing crazy on the C drive and you could just use a SAS drive, but maybe you need flash or SSD drives for your data. Maybe you're running some database technologies on that. That's where you'd mix and match those drives as well. So all of these types of stores that we've spoken about that are included in, in a storage account um, are all going to have, um, they're all going to be durable. They're all going to be encrypted at rest. They're all going to have strong and consistent replication. They're going to be fault tolerant and they're automatically going to be load balanced because all of it is built on a unified and distributed storage system. So let's talk about encryption. Um, customers ask this question all the time, you know, is my data encrypted in the cloud? You know, at what point does it get encrypted? As soon as you start consuming data, it's going to be enc encrypted at rest uh, in Azure. So that's great. It is enabled, uh, it, it is, we, we provide you with keys and that's enabled by default as soon as you start consuming that data. Customers can also bring their own keys to their storage account. Um, my only advice is kind of a bit of a pro tip. Um, if you bring your own keys and you start already consuming data, it would only protect from the date in which you provided your keys. So instead of having to, mat to kind of manage those two sets of keys, stand up your storage, enable your own keys, and then start consuming and bringing in that data that will enable you to use those keys for moving forward. Um, so all the security and compliance requirements your company may ask about, uh, about encryption, et cetera, we, we have white papers and all sorts of references for you to get into more detail on that. But it is available for all the different types of storage that, that I just spoke about. So let's talk about redundancy and replication. 
So everyone wants their data, you know, in a, in a redundant state. So in traditional data centers, we might stripe our data um, or put it into an array of some sort and have that resiliency built into our, our, our SAN storage. Um, in Azure, the most basic type of redundancy that we offer is called LRS, that is locally redundant storage. What this means is you'll have three copies of your data in one region. So if you're consuming, let's say in UK South, you stand up um, a storage account, maybe some blob storage, you'll get three exact copies of that data. Um, in UK South. Now, there is no resiliency in this. So we this is great for like dev and test workloads or anything that doesn't need any kind of replication el elsewhere. Um, but we don't necessarily recommend this for production workloads because you are kind of limited to, to where it goes, i.e. one data center and three copies. So to go to step further for needing a little bit more replication and more a little bit more resiliency in your data, we have GRS, and this is geo-redundant storage. This means that you get six copies of your data, six full copies. So you're going to get three copies in your primary region. So let's just say for argument's sake, we're in UK South. Um, then it will asynchronously replicate your data to like UK West, and that's your second copy of your data. But your reads and write come out of that primary location. Um, so you have six copies so that if you do lose that primary location, that secondary location is there and ready and available for you. But you'll read and write from the primary for unless there is an outage in that region. Next up was we have read access geo redundant storage. So this is a step up from GRS. Um, this is just like GRS, except we add a read access capability to it. So you still get six replicas of your data. Um, you get that asynchronous replication to your secondary site, but you can read that data from the secondary site. Um, now, why would you do this? Um, get your data closer to your end users. If you have applications that might have a lot of latency today, and maybe you're hosted in a data center in Europe, but you have users in New York, um, being able to host that data closer to them is key. That means the latency is lowered and they can access that data. So they can read that data without uh, an issue and be able to access whatever it is they're trying to access. Next one I'm going to talk about is ZRS, and that's zone redundant storage. So you're going to have three replicas across three zones. So in uh, in the European data centers and UK South, we have three zones. Think of this as three physical buildings. So you're going to be on completely redundant power, um, cooling, heating, et cetera, but in three various buildings. So this is like having three physical data centers in a region. And this kind of changes our story of how we talk about DR. Do we need to be in two different regions or does one region in those three zones uh, suffice? And it comes with a higher SLA. So the zone redundant storage is, is another option instead of maybe replicating it to other regions as well. So now we're going to create our data store in Azure. So we're going to go into the Azure portal. Um, I'm in the Azure portal now. And this is pretty easy, pretty basic. We can see some resources that are available at the top here. Um, I'm just going to go to the hamburger button at the top left, and I'm going to create a resource. Um, really cool fun fact is anything we offer in Azure is going to be available here in the marketplace on the left-hand side. Um, if you want to deploy something maybe with IoT or AI machine learning, any products we offer under those, those kind of subjects will be available in that marketplace. The most highly deployed things across the world are what you'll see in the popular side. So you can see Windows Server 2016, Ubuntu, web apps, SQL databases, function apps, all sorts of good stuff. So we should see storage account down the bottom. Another great thing that Microsoft has been really hot on the last few years is documentation. So if I click on any product, there'll be documentation about it. So I click on this documentation tab and it takes me to this page where it shows me the different concepts. So everything I'm speaking to you about today, you can go and reference. It's docs.microsoft.com. Or you can access it directly from the portal from whatever you're trying to, to deploy. So a how-to guide of how to create a storage account and, and kind of the major concepts around data and data storage. And if you go down here, it talks about kind of the cloud storage solutions, hybrid storage solutions and what we offer, and different types of data operations as well. So we can get you started. They'll offer some code snippets maybe as well, how to get this started maybe in the Azure CLI. So even if you're not looking at storage and you're looking at something like Kubernetes or maybe just you know Linux VMs, anything else, um, any of the products, maybe Spark Analytics, you can go to the, the docs.microsoft.com and you'll have some great documentation there available for you. So I'm going to go and create a storage account. Now, everything I'm doing is going to be dependent on my Wi-Fi. Um, I'm a bit of a rebel. I love doing my demos on the fly, but I need to make sure my Wi-Fi doesn't cut out or the devo gods hate me. So if this does break, we'll find out, but um, we should be fine. So I'm going to create a new resource group. I'm going to call it Glasgow. Hit OK. Uh, we're going to call a storage account name. I'm just going to call it Glasgow user group. And location, I want to declare it to go into, I'm going to go into West Europe. So West Europe 
is kind of like our flagship data center over here uh, east of the U.S. Um, anything that comes out in the east U.S. data centers, West Europe is usually the first to get kind of like the latest and greatest stuff. So I have a performance option here. I can go standard or premium. Standard will be absolutely sufficient for what we're doing. But if you have some major SLAs and resiliency requirements, premium is another way to go. Uh, it asked me what kind of account I want to have. Now, this will be the API that you connect into for your storage uh, for any maybe kind of development purposes. Storage v2 tends to really suffice for everyone. Um, if you click on it, you can get to storage v1 or even blob storage. And then this replication. So we just went through all through these different types of replication here. So you can see LRS, ZRS, GRS. We also see two more. Zone, geo zone redundant storage and read access geo zone redundant storage. So because data is so critical, we are constantly making improvements to our storage capability and we're constantly adding different types of storage. Now, the GZRS and the RAGZRS are not available in all data centers. So that's why I like showing West Europe because it is available. But maybe if you're, you know, I was giving a talk in Brazil and, and they didn't have a lot of these available to them. So it was really hard to show that. So I had to use another region. Uh, but I'm going to use GRS for our demo. And then we have an access tier. I can go, do I want hot storage or cool storage? Hot storage will be great. And it's going to create that storage account. So this is going to create it on the fly for us. And remember, this is just our storage account. We haven't deployed any type of storage to it. The world is our oyster. Um, so what we're, we are going to do is we're going to stand up Azure files. So I'm going to let this deploy. Hopefully it only takes a few seconds. Um, let's see. So it's already deployed. I'm going to go to my resource here, click on my resource, and we have the storage account. So I can see exactly what I've just qualified, um, what the resource group name is. I can see that because it's GRS, it's deployed to West Europe and it pairs with North Europe. Uh, and North Europe is in uh, Dublin, by the way. I didn't, I, I didn't make up the names and I apologize because yeah, someone didn't look at a map when they named those, but that's a whole other story. So uh, we, we can look at our storage account here and we can see, you know, we can talk about access keys to it. We can talk about this encryption piece. So where I spoke to you before about bringing your own customer managed keys, all we need to do is save that or click that and save it and we've done it. But the first thing I want to do is I want to create a file share. So let's say, you know, someone in your organization comes up to you and goes, hey, I need some storage for what? You know, it could be an application, could be a project, could be anything. Um, we're going to call it my files. I'm going to give a quota of one gig and always they, you know, the kind of, you know, there's always maybe meetings about how much storage we need. And then you have to see if you, if you have enough space in your environment and then maybe you need to source some disk. Is it the right type of storage? Can they do with it? There's always kind of a back and forth when we, when we go to create storage. So I've just created a new file share called my files. It's only a gig in size, but when I go to this file share here on the right hand side, I can see I have some options here. So the first thing I want to do is, you know, that maybe this person comes back to me and says, you know what, I need a terabyte of storage. Is that okay? You go, absolutely, it's okay. Not a problem. How often do you get to say that in an environment? We hit in a terabyte, we type in a terabyte, and we have a terabyte. So we've gone from a gig to a terabyte in like half a second. Um, the other thing I can do is when I browse this is I can connect to my, my files. So I told you that it, uh, Azure file supports Mac, Linux, and um, Windows v and uh, OSs, right? So I'm a big PowerShell fan, so I like to automate as much as I can in PowerShell. So I can go and give myself a drive letter for the storage drive, I can call it P or whatever I want to do, um, and run this script locally on my VM, and it will, it will um, hook in that that shared file, um, excuse me, um, path, and allow it to reconnect on reboot. So I have it on my Windows uh, machine, and it could be another server, it could be my own personal laptop, whatever I'm connecting from. Um, and then the same thing on the Linux side and the Mac side as well. So we, we cover off pretty much all the operating systems. Uh, the other thing I can do here is I can take snapshots of my data, and I can delete the share, um, and I can change the properties of it as well. So we can go in and manipulate it. But I want to take this a step further, because great, we've created a file share. Um, that's neat. But I want to do something a little bit more useful. So. Let's take our use case. Um, all of us probably have dealt with this before. Someone comes to you and goes, right, uh, I have something coming up and I needed this yesterday. And you're like, okay, what do you need? Um, so in this case, we are going to be the IT team and someone has come to us and say, you know what, I'm running an event in a few months and I really need a website stood up. Where can I put it? And you're looking at your infrastructure and you go, yep, yep, we have no space on premise. We're out of storage. Uh, I got to build them a VM. How much redundancy do you want on that? And 
the event's coming up and they really want it because like, the marketing team wants to start pushing it out and getting people involved, right? Okay. Uh, we can put it on a VM in Azure. Again, you have the same issue. Well, there's capacity there. We have to manage the VMs and the overhead. And really, we just don't want to manage more VMs. We don't have capacity in our team to do that. We could put it as a website. Uh, we could put it as like a, 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 you know, a web app in Azure. And then there's no OS to manage. And then we just run it. The redundancy is like kind of built in. Actually, quick and dirty, we're going to build a static website in Azure with our website. So our developers have handed us our code. So here we go. This is our code. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go into a plugin. So I'm in Vir Visual Studio Code. Um, it is my favorite IDE that I like to work with because when I'm either you know deploying PowerShell code or writing like Terraform or any kind of ARM templating, anything infrastructure is code related, it, it helps correct my code writing and make suggestions. And it's it's really great. But I can connect to Azure with it as well. So, you know, I've been handed my code from the developers. They said, yep, nothing you need to do. We've tested it works. I hit the Azure button and it's already synced to my uh, using my Active Directory account. And I'm synced up to my Azure subscription and it's going to load my subscription in a moment. Um, again, this is going to be Internet dependent for me today. And everything's been running really great up until now. So we'll see how it goes. So. I will be able to see my subscription and all the storage accounts I already have deployed. Um, there's a great button here called deploy to static website. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to click on that. Um, it's still trying to connect to my subscription, unfortunately. So while it's doing that, I'm going to let that think. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into um, our static website option here in the file storage. So we already have this built in. I don't have to use VS Code, but I can hit enabled. Uh, I'm just going to call it index.index.html um, and our error path. I'm just going to create a 404 and then I can save it. So I'm going to actually create the static website from Azure itself. Um, it will give me an endpoint here that I can connect into. You can also bring custom DNS name to that. That's also possible. So hopefully there we go. It has happened. So uh, it asked me what folder I want to deploy from and this is where my code is. So I'm going to select that and I can actually create a new storage account from VS Code. I don't have to leave leave VS Code, but I can see the storage account I've created for you guys. And I'm going to click on that. And it's actually deploying it to, you can see down the bottom here, it's deploying our code and it's uploading it. So it's already uploaded about 30% of our code. So I don't have to leave VS Code. Um, and VS Code is interesting because a lot of ops teams are like, ooh, but that's a developer tool. But we're, we're seeing so many more ops teams, you know, automating and using infrastructure's code. And, and VS Code is, a, is an IDE that caters to both devs and ops, te and ops teams. So right, I can see here that it's uploaded. Uh, it's given me the primary endpoint, and I'm going to browse that website. I'm going to click on it. And I should have, oh, sorry to open the other side. My bad. And we now have a website that we have uploaded in a matter of a couple minutes. So we've taken the marketing team's request to get this upside, up, website up and running somewhere in our infrastructure. We looked at our options and said, you know, we just need to get it up and running. It does have six copies of that data floating around in Azure. And we've taken the code and gotten uploaded and it's running. Now that means with a static website, we know we have six copies of it. We don't have to manage an infrastructure as such. We just have to manage that data and that storage account. Does anyone have any questions on that? There's nothing in the chat, April. Either. All right, cool. Cool, cool, cool. So that's a really cool feature I like in Azure Storage. Um, this one's a bit of a, a Microsoft slide. Um, I do apologize, but it's learning anything more about storage itself or you want to get learning about anything else, Kubernetes, uh, you know, virtual machines, we have Microsoft Learn. Um, so this link, if you guys want to take a screenshot of it, will take you there. Uh, but if you go into Microsoft Learn and start typing in uh, whatever it is you want to learn, we have so much great free learning content there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Cosmos DB now. And this is part of our modern data state solution that we have in Azure today that we offer up. So this is going to be for your non-relational and NoSQL types of data. Um, I, uh, the Cosmos DB is, is globally distributed. It is a NoSQL offering. And we have APIs that you can use that you may be familiar with in your, in your data centers today or in your uh, environments today. Use those APIs to connect into it. So you can use things like Cassandra, Spark, MongoDB, and Gremlin. 
And we use uh, Cosmos for powering global solutions. We see a lot of customers use it for building real-time customer experiences because it is globally distributed, because it writes so quickly. It's great for things like gaming, IoT, and, e and e-commerce sites. Uh, it is a very simplified development process with, with serverless architecture, and it's a fully managed service. And it is our turnkey global uh, distribution that we have at Microsoft. It is highly available. So you can do automatic and manual failover. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, it has multi-homing APIs. So you don't have to worry about app redeployment every time. It's low latency. So while packets can't move you know, faster than the speed of light, you can send your packets across um, the network pretty quickly. And if you want to think of it as if you're trying to deliver kind of you know, static content, our content delivery network is what we built for that. If you want to deliver dynamic content, Azure Cosmos DB is, is, was built exactly just for that. So I'm going to go into the Cosmos DB piece uh, and give you a bit of a show of it. So I've already pre-deployed this Cosmos database. Now, the database is. Um, a managed service completely and entirely. So what does that mean? We offer it as, let me pull back up. Um, we offer it as a managed service. So it will come out of the box with an SLA um, and there's no OS to manage. So it takes probably, depending on the day, depending on the usage in the data center. So that can change, unfortunately, but uh, it can anyway, take anywhere from 10 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, depending if you're uploading data, what kind of configuration you're doing at the same time. But this one probably takes about 10, 12 minutes to spin up. So I tend to build this ahead of time. Um, but I've given it a name. Uh, it's deployed to West Europe and North Europe right now. And I have an external endpoint, which I can connect to it on. Now, Azure Storage has the Azure Storage Explorer, which you can hook into your data and see your data. You can download it free uh, to your laptop or your server and see what's in your storage account. We have the same thing for Data Explorer. You can download that or run it from the portal and see what, what kind of data collections you have listed and what you're doing. Um, I Maybe I want to see my connection strings um, and, and connect to it, build it into my code, use it for my testing, maybe for how I'm rotating my different environments. And we have Mongo preview features available. So we can enable these straight from the portal and build that in. Um, we can kind of configure all the private endpoints and all the networking around that as well. But one of the best features about Cosmos I really like about it is that we can replicate that data globally. So right now, I'm writing to West Europe and North Europe. I can disable multiple multi-region writes. I can also configure manual and automatic failover up here in the in the in the corner. So if I'm maybe working with maybe I have an office in the US, I can select the offices I want to connect to or the data center regions um, and save it. And what it's going to do is it's going to take that data in my database and replicate that across my regions. Now, this will probably take a few minutes, um, probably more than we already have, but it'll replicate that data across for us. That's all I have to do to replicate my database. So for having, um, you know, if you're working with containerization or just, you know, geolocated applications, this is a great technology to look at to get that, that maximum write speed. So next up, we're going to talk about SQL, Postgres, and MySQL. Um, again, this is part of our modern data state for relational data. And the, the MySQL and Postgres and Maria will be our open source options for those database technologies. Now, Azure SQL Database Service, again, is offered as a managed service. Um, you can bring your SQL licensing from on-premise into the cloud today. So we call that our Azure Hybrid Use Benefit. Um, and that's fantastic if you're looking, you know, you're already licensed for it, but you're like, oh, we can't move to the cloud because we already have a license, you can bring it with you. Um, the Azure database, SQL database service comes with a 99.99% SLA straight out of the box. It has built-in intelligence into it. So it's a kind of an all-inclusive package deal. So when you start consuming the Azure SQL databases, we offer kind of different flavors. So we have the single database option, which is just very predictable workloads. Maybe you're kind of de dev test workloads. Uh, we do have you know, different performance tiers on that. So we have basic, standard, and premium. So this is really much a simplified single database model. Um, we also have the elastic pool, which is kind of like our shared resource model. So you can set how much uh, consumption and you know you might need in your database, and it can scale up and scale down. And going a step further, we have some customers that want to go the full SQL database option, but their databases have maybe some schema changes or some compatibility issues. So they put into a managed instance. So you get all the feature benefits of running the SQL Azure database service without kind of all the limitations. So they kind of can run that instead uh, without doing a full virtual machine. You get the database service options, but with a little bit more control of your database. So the managed instance is your full SQL server surface area. Um, so it does fit that like price point in between 
uh, you know, running SQL on a VM and then running that service. So it is like that middle ground, uh, but it's always up to date, has built in HA and again, 4.9 SLA out of the box. Um, it has built in intelligent, uh, intelligent performance and security. And the thing that's really cool about it is we see a lot of customers consuming machine learning services, especially with Azure SQL database. So maybe today you have an application um, and you're transacting to your database and whether the database is in the cloud or another place, um, you know, we, we do have customers that are maybe transacting, you know, entirely in the cloud, but then taking their data out of that uh, database and sending it to an analytics service where they're modeling and transforming that data. And then they send that to scoring method, and then they have to write it back to the database and then back to the application. So this is a lot of latency. With the Azure SQL database service, their application writes straight to the Azure SQL database, and then all the modeling and scoring and, and training happens within that database. So you reduce that latency requirement. So customers that are really looking to consume ML, this is a great thing to look at uh, for you coming back in. So then how do you migrate your database? Um, you got to assess your database. Now we have a free tool, the Azure SQL uh, database migration service um, that kind of calculates, you know, what your TCO is going to be, how you're going to migrate it, and helps you optimize your database as well as you go to the cloud. So this service is great because it allows you to move everything uh, with almost near zero downtime and let you scale your migration as well and let you orchestrate it. So you have full control over it and it is a full free tool, so it's really good. So the, all the Azure databases that we have, uh, the, the same managed services that we have for SQL, we have for MySQL and Postgres and MariaDB. And I think the underlying you know, trend is we want everything to be an easy lift and shift. We want everything to be um, very much enterprise ready and secure and compliant. And that's what customers need. And be able to bring the languages and frameworks of your choice as well. So again, we have uh, docs.microsoft.com. For any of these technologies we spoke about today, you can go straight to docs.microsoft.com or you can use these links. And then we have the Azure SQL Data Warehouse and Azure Data Factory. So this is, again, part of our modern data state. And this is really looking at your complex queries across petabytes and petabytes of data. Um, the Azure SQL Data Warehouse is going to be fast with best-in-class performance. It's going to be secure and it's going to be completely flexible. And then the Azure Data Factory is really that ability to modernize your data warehouse at scale. So we have a lot of customers that are maybe consuming data on-premise today and, and maybe like Oracle, SQL, uh, SAP, et cetera, and they need to ingest that data. Or maybe they do it from another cloud provider like AWS, GCP, or maybe another SaaS solution like Salesforce or Dynamics. All that can be ingested from these different places into your Azure Data Factory. It goes into Azure Data Blob Storage, and then you can prep and train that data. And we have our Azure Databricks service, which really just sits on top of Spark. And then we model and serve that data, and we can serve it out through Power BI. So we have that full lifecycle management of your data with the Azure Data Factory offering. So again, docs.microsoft.com. You can copy these links down, um, or feel free to just go to docs.microsoft.com. So really, in summary, there's a huge amount of options available for your, for you and your end users and your organizations with cloud data storage. So everything we offer and everything I spoke about today is going to be scalable. It's going to be reliable. It's going to be simple with built-in intelligence, um, all fully managed options and global, and global availability built into a lot of the products. So I want to thank everyone. Um, I just want to open this up for questions and answer anything you might have. Awesome. Thank you, April. That was really good. Anybody got any questions? There's nothing in the chat at the moment, but um, feel free to come off mute and give April a shout. Um, I've got one. Uh, you said at the start when you were talking about setting up storage accounts and one of the options was geo-redundant read access. Is it possible to have multiple read zones? Uh, yeah. Not yet. Um, not yet. So it's it's definitely been discussed, but not quite yet. So a lot of times it, it depends what you're trying to serve with that data. Um, if there's something you need to, to replicate over multiple zones, there's potentially ways we can do it um, or use a third party way to do it. Not a third party, but maybe another tool to do it within Azure, if that makes sense. But it's not built into the storage platform itself as an SLA. Um, the one thing I will say is if you have any of that kind of feedback, it's definitely welcomed. Um, I would say Microsoft now versus 10 years ago, we're very open to feedback and, and hearing that. And the more we hear about a product, the faster it's going to come to market, the faster it's going to come to fruition. So a lot in times in my role, when I'm working with customers, 
I work directly with the product groups. So I'm building something for a customer and there might be a limitation in our own product. I work with the product groups directly. And same thing with the UK data centers, um, you know, because of unfortunately Brexit and the whole political situation, like people's demand for the UK data has been massive, but they're trying to really ramp everything up. But the more requests they get in for these types of technologies, the faster they're going to get them out. And, and, and they see that they put that on the roadmap and they listen. It unfortunately won't be tomorrow, but they absolutely listen and take that on. So where's the best place to leave that kind of feedback if you're not a uh, you know, big customer directly interacting with Microsoft? Um, Sarah, I know it's gonna be a weird question. I do you have the links for that? Um yeah, I can dig them out. There's user voice, which is the main platform. I think it's is it uservoice.microsoft.com? I think like, so. And there's also and uh, we do in. Yeah, and we do offer up some groups as well. Um let me find the links for you if that's okay. Um, I see, I mean, there's feedback in like TechNet, whenever we post articles and stuff into like TechNet and IT ops, there's always that ability to post into those forms as well. There's so many places you can give feedback. Um, let me find a, a good use case and I'll send one over. Thank you. So there are a couple of other questions in the chat here. Um, John's asking, are Elastic Pools limited to resource groups? Um, no, they're not. Um, Elastic Pools aren't necessarily limited to re resource groups, but there's a good reason to keep it in a resource group. Um, I've never I've never spread a resource, uh, an Elastic Pool outside of one, if I'm honest, um, because of the re redundancy requirements from a customer. I haven't encountered it personally. Um, is there a specific UK case you're thinking of? Yeah, no, I was just gonna think if it would be possible or not. We're kind of cleaning up um, our Azure directories at the moment. It's kind of growing organically, so things are kind of in the, the wrong resource groups at the moment. Uh, where we're cleaning that up, we could potentially maybe look at using Elastic Pools, um, but hopefully that won't really be a problem once we kind of move everything into the, the right place. Yeah, so what I did with a customer recently is we built an environment to kind of test some things, and then the, 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 the kind of C level said, right, well, we need like, this needs to be production ready, not just like MVP, minimum viable product. Uh, we actually migrated to, we built a new resource group. So we built um, a, a, a whole new hub and spoke design and not just a flat resource group or everything in, in separate resource groups. And because some of the developers and ops guys were going in and just like deploying stuff because they could. Um, <laughs> so we put in Azure policy, locked that down and then we built out a whole new framework and migrated everything in over to the new resource groups. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we're looking at doing, just um, tidy everything up. Um, as you'll see, look, we've put the same situation where everything's kind of not really planned very well, but that, that'll change within the next few months, hopefully. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunately planning. It's one of those things when you're building out in Azure, you have to plan out your networking and your resource groups, but you can migrate things across pretty easily in the resource group side of it. So, um, yeah, so good luck. But do give us a shout if you have any questions as you're on your journey. Yeah, thank you. Um, got another question around best place to learn, um, getting up to speed with things. Um, mm -hmm. I think you posted some links um, within your slide deck, April, and I think we're both pro probably going to say Microsoft Learn is a great place to start because it is into chunks. Like you can jump in at whatever level you want, do a module for ten minutes, then jump out, come back to it, and pick it up. Or you can do, or you can spend all day, which I have done on some modules, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, working yeah. through it. And I think the great thing about it um, is that you can have some sandboxes within mm -hmm. it. So it takes you through how to do things with, and it spins up its own Azure subscription, which is totally free. We pay for all of that. And you can do that safely and not run a big bill at the end of it. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, sorry, I've just answered your, that question from me. But <laughs> no, it's totally fine, but it's true. MS Learn's fantastic. And I was working with an internal colleague the other day who had a technical question and he was asking me all these questions. And I'm like, well, that's great. Um, just go to MS Learn, dude, and look it up. And he's like, oh, you know, like even as internal employees, like we forget it's there. Um, people are adding content all the time. But yeah, I sometimes jump around tracks and go, you know, I actually wanna learn more about this. Um, a lot of best practice will be in there. Um, I will say also, you, you tend to learn bad habits 
and best practice as you go along. And the docs.microsoft.com is also really good with like examples of how to do things. So when you talk about governance and, and maybe how to deploy an architecture in a certain way, the docs.microsoft.com is also really good. So it's a docs.microsoft.com, MS Learn. Um, and there's always like third party things like Pluralsight, et cetera, but the MS Learn stuff is all free. And you can't beat free. And it's it's solid. It's absolutely solid. Um, I've, I Even if you're going to take exams, it's a great place to start. Awesome. Um, another question here is, can Azure Files connect into your on-premise Active Directory? So they have just come live with that, I want to say, last week. Mm -hmm. think it is available. So full Active Directory integration. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a limiter to that statement. <laughs> But it is out now. Um, it hasn't always been perfect in the past um, to, kind of, to kind of bring your 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 um, even your file server <coughs> structure, excuse me, and um, authentication over. But yeah, that is now out and live. I actually don't know if that's in the UK data centers. I know it's in Europe, so I do apologize. Um, I know I know it is out though. It is actually a full feature at the moment. Um, I think there's some great stuff around it on itopstalk.com. Um, my colleague Thomas Maurer actually interviewed the program manager a few months ago um, and talk, talked about the feature and walked through the demo when it was in preview, but obviously that's now went live. So there's some great material on there by the, the product team themselves. So you can, I'll, I'll dig out the link and post that in the chat as well. Yes, feedback.azure.com is a great one. Um, for the feedback mechanism. Also, um, if you have any issues, and I'm, I'm going to put this in for storage, but it's also pertinent to all the other Azure technologies. I just put that in twice. I'm really sorry. My computer's having a moment with Teams. Uh, but you guys, sorry. Um, we we always welcome feedback on GitHub as well. Any product issues, et cetera, you can open up an issue on GitHub. If you're working on something and you're like, this broke, it's annoying me, and you can open up an issue. Um, so that's also open to give that direct feedback there. But yes, the feedback.azure.com is the way to go. Thank you, Ross, for reminding me. My brain just melted. Um, but yeah, and then also in, in GitHub. I mean, it's it's uh, you can give direct feedback there and open up an issue and you will get a response to it. Awesome. Does anybody get any other questions for April? I had one question. There you go. Where can I get a cat riding a T-Rex t-shirt? <laughs> um, on the other side of my laptop, I have the sticker as well. I think, yeah, it's on my laptop as well. I probably have a few stickers um, somewhere. I bought this in Redmond at our corporate office. It's whenever I go to Redmond, I come back with like 20 t-shirts. And uh, yeah, I bought it at our corporate office. So if you are ever in Redmond, you can order it. I, there is a store.microsoft.com available in the EU. I don't know if it's on there. They've not been great about selling cool stuff on there. If I'm honest, they'll sell some Azure stuff, but yeah, they definitely sell it at our corporate office. Fair enough. Once COVID is over, I'll make a trip. Absolutely. We, I think we all are. I think we're all like, I'm ready to get on a plane now. Um, I'm there. <laughs> so. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Is there any more questions before we let April go? Cool. Well, if you guys need anything else at all, um, please do feel free to ping me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, so I am UK based, despite sounding like an American, I am, but I'm, I live here. Um, <laughs> so I am not leaving this time zone anytime soon, unfortunately. So I'm always happy to take questions, uh, not just about storage as well. Um, I work across a lot of products in Azure and all over the cloud. If I don't have the answer, I will try to find someone that will, whether it be Sarah or another one in the team. Um, but I just want to thank you guys for having me. It was great to, to speak to everyone. Great questions. Um, everyone was very too well behaved, I, I think, but uh, have have an awesome time. Awesome. Thank you, April, so Thanks much. Thanks all. Cheers. Um, our next session is with Mark and Richard. So I'm going to hand over to the guys to do their bit. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's uh, let's try and take it up a notch or down a notch. That's a, a great act to follow there. I, I do like the T-shirts. I thought we were cool for T-shirts, but I need to go back to marketing and have a chat to those folks. Um, <laughs> We wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for giving us the time and also just 
use this to try and address a couple of questions that people have been asking us over the last 12 months. And uh, tell you a little bit about Nginx, Nginx and F5 networks, and then get into some demos to try and stitch it all together. So that's what we're planning to do for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so. I'm, I'm just going to go through the, the following um, quick overview of Nginx, what we're about, just to assist those that have never heard of us, those that have heard of us, broaden the context of what you probably know about Nginx. And then I'll hand over to Mark and we'll get into some demos to try and pull this together. So hopefully that's OK. Um, any questions, please feel to ask or interrupt. But uh, we've got a little section at the end just to go into that as well. So. I would normally do a poll, so if we're in a room, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to put your hands up who's heard of Nginx, and typically we hear a lot of people that say, yep, we know we know who you are, we've heard about you, you're, you're the web guys. Um, and that's pretty correct. We run 70% of the world's websites, um, somewhere in the region of 450 million sites use Nginx software, and they actually break down into the top 10,000 websites. That we, we have something like 80, 89% of that coverage. Um, so we know a few things about how to provide fast, highly performant, highly scalable software architectures. Um, the typical services that our software is used for is within the web domain as a good old web server. So I'm a bit disappointed to didn't, didn't see this in the marketplace there. We need to get some more downloads going on the Azure marketplace. Um, but we use typically for a web server content um, we provide a number of different services in standard low, low balancing, lightweight approach to low balancing. Um, we've got a big caching contingent. A number of the large streaming companies use our technology to enable uh, the streaming content distribution. And uh, the, the recent streaming provider that came to market is, uh, is a loyal Nginx customer. And then we have sort of standard patterns of deployment, which are sort of simple reverse proxy. Um, all of this software is deployable across multiple environments, so we're fairly agnostic in where we're deployed. We're very at home in the multi-cloud space, and equally we're very comfortable within a containerized microservices environment, which is where we see a lot of transition. Um, it's also probably worth positioning that when we were acquired by F5, which was in May last year, so we're just over a year into the acquisition, there was a, a number of questions as to why a company such as F5 Networks with a heritage in traditional infrastructure would be looking to acquire Nginx who essentially come from the open source community. And it's very true that we're very loyal to the open source community who've made us what we are today. But we also have a commercial enterprise, which is um, where we generate revenue to plow back into our open source community and also develop our products. And the one key message that we brought with the acquisition into F5 is a simplicity story. So Nginx are really focused about trying to consolidate and uh, improve efficiency. In either um, old monolithic environments where we have had significant success or moving into the more modern containerized environments, which we'll talk and demo uh, in a little while. Um, and they said, well, that's really cool, Richard, but where does that sit with F5 and what does that mean? Well, we talk about a story that we say is code to customer. How do we take the applications that are developed for the benefit of our customer? How do we deliver that? And what we try to show is where Nginx focuses its time, efforts, resources on development and um, leadership. And that's really close to the code. It's a part of our philosophy to be as close to the app as we can, whilst ensuring that we can deliver the content to the rest of the environment. So um, I saw when we did the, the word search earlier on, the diversity of different titles and roles and personas. Um, we're very much comfortable in the application development community, which is where we our heritage comes from. And indeed, with the portfolio that exists within F5, we can provide a true sort of scalable end-to-end -end, um, solution. So how we do that is via an application platform which builds on open source community software. It builds on our enterprise grade product sets. And also it provides some control plane capability to manage all of that. So I'm just going to quickly shoot through with a focus on the Nginx Plus software set, which is the 
premium grade software of the open source project that we have and just highlight some of the areas where typically our customers are using our, our code base today. So Nginx Plus, which is the enterprise grade software, is used for multiple personalities in a multitude of different ways. It has somewhere in the region of 200 different directives within its code base that can allow it to assume, configure personalities of different types of function. So we're quite comfortable being used, as I mentioned earlier, as a web server, but we can also provide enhanced security features and functions. We're typically used, encouragingly, more so in API Gateway with the way that markets developing and, and application capital of um, app development. Uh, and then we have a number of different sort of services and, and functions which are enabled. And all of these are multifunctional concurrently within the code itself. So it's a very small piece of code, you know, two, three meg in size. If you get a chance to look on YouTube, we have a very compelling demo of a product guy booting up Nginx on a floppy drive and, uh, and doing some web serving content of that. It's very portable, very suitable for containerized environments in, in the cloud. And that's where we're going to focus some of our demonstration um, a little bit later on. We mentioned it runs anywhere. And for today's benefit, we're very happy to be involved in the multi-cloud environment. Um, but we are sort of agnostic to where we get deployed. So we're suitably used in small containerized platforms, large containerized platforms, pure bare metal ARM processors. They're we have some interesting work going on with ARM in that space, um, and then traditional sort of Linux environments. The functions of what we provide, if you take one of those directives and focus down on how do I route my traffic, my applications, either into or out of my cloud or on-prem environment, or between my applications within my microservices um, containerized environment, we provide load balancing functions, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about. And these are some of the examples of how that's um, configured and deployed and, and the nature of some of those services that are used within the load balancing context. Um, we're very focused on security. And I think one of the beauties of being part of the product group within F5 Networks now is that within the last year, we've been able to take a lot of the security code and practice that F5 are known for and to port that across onto Nginx code. So we can now bring uh, high capability performance security into a lightweight deployable piece of code that lives across many different um, footprints. Um, and as a result of that, we're seeing an increased usage of changing the security posture or the security points at where our development customers or communities look to in invoke. Um, so App Protect, which is a new product released last month, joint effort of F5 um, intellectual property and Nginx intellectual property is getting a lot of good traction. And we're, we're trying to cover that in a second as well. We're known for our traditional web server and um, we're delighted to be the number one web server as a result of our community support. And we, we thank everyone for that. Uh, and it's great. And I know loads of people are using um, Nginx as a web server at home for sort of uh, private projects. But equally, we run some of the biggest websites in the world, um, Netflix, uh, uh, Uber, and a few others, computer manufacturers as an example. Very popular, very well um, deployed within the retail space as well, particularly because of the performance capability, low footprint, low memory utilization, high capability concurrency of connections. So um, typically, we find ourselves getting used to deliver high performance web, websites. And particularly with the current situation over the last three months, an increasing reliance on um, using Nginx in some of those front end services that are being deployed now within a lot of organizations. Um, I mentioned content co caching. Um, BBC is a big uh, user of this. iPlayer goes through our content caching capability. So we power a lot of CDNs which um, are, are globally deployed. And this has been able to allow us to deliver some of that scalability I talked about. Um, Netflix, as an example, use this. And some of you may be familiar with the work that uh, Netflix have done, particularly around their architectures. Monitoring is key for anything. If you're delivering an end-to-end -end service, um, the visibility of that. And within the Nginx portfolio, or the Nginx software with uh, Nginx Plus, we deliver a high grade of 
capability of monitoring. So pulling this data back into some of the data storage that we talked about is uh, is fairly second nature for us. And there's a lot of goodness to be taken out of um, the metrics and KPIs that we're able to show within the platform. Clearly goes without saying, I would hope that we provide highly available environments. So this is very much um, uh, an enterprise five nines environment deployment. Um, and then finally, just to talk about some of the media streaming services that uh, we're enabling. Uh, I think I mentioned mentioned one a recent American cartoon company that's come to market utilizes uh, our, our services for the streaming capabilities and some unique features within that as well. From a programmatic point of view, we have a lot of integration, a lot of capability within the code set itself, but equally we can um, integrate to ecosystem partners and we take a, a, an API first approach to delivering these services. And just finally to show the difference between our open source project, which um, has supported us uh, over the last 17 years and the commercial capability. Um, we just see on the left hand side some of the features that we used in commercial open source land and then on the right hand side our enterprise customers that need a little bit more, a little bit additional technical capability or perhaps require some additional service support or just need a way of engaging with Nginx in a secure contained manner. Um, some of our customers uh, don't wish to publicly discuss some of the challenges they're having. So they can use that with the, the enterprise grade uh, software that we have available to them. So with that, I'm going to sort of move on and we'll get into the sort of meat of this. We're going to try and show um, a context of stitching this together. Uh, and Mark will talk through and demo a number of elements using third party and also uh, Nginx software to try and um, articulate that story. So bear with me and I will transfer across to Mark. And away we go. Right, all yours, Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to pray to the demo gods too, because I'm doing it live as well. So. Um, We'll see how it works. Uh, so I'm running I'm running a Kubernetes cluster in Azure, um, obviously. It's an Azure user group. Um, so I'm using AKS, and I have uh, a number of services deployed in Azure. So a AKS, if, if those who may not be aware of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes is an orchestration platform for containers. Um, and the way it typically gets deployed is you will have a number of masters and a number of nodes. Um, the, the, the Kubernetes master takes care of um, API, it manages an API server, which Kubernetes is, is, is based around. You have APIs, you have um, specifications within those APIs, and then you have operators that then uh, pick up API uh, uh, definitions and, and, and work on them to, to deliver the service. Uh, in terms of scheduling containers, there's a scheduler as well, and, and various other bits and pieces that manage the whole framework. Besides the master, there are Kubernetes nodes, and the nodes are the Kubernetes instances that actually manage um, the containers. They run the containers, and they manage the internal network between all of these different instances that you deploy. Um, when it comes to Kubernetes, it's it's all held within a within a as essentially a private network and how you get traffic into that private network is is usually through one of a couple of different ways so if you're in a cloud provider you can make use of a load balancer service in which case a azure load balancer will be spun up to manage traffic into that environment um, if you're in an on-prem service or, or or on a cloud and you and you want to have more um, finer grained control over the ingress to that network, you can use something called an ingress controller. And an ingress controller is, is one of the deployment personalities of Nginx. So Nginx can sit in your Kubernetes environment and manage traffic into that environment, and it can be driven entirely by your application developers. They can specify how traffic is routed once it gets into the Kubernetes environment and which nodes, uh, which pods it is delivered to within that environment. 
And this enables them to do things like um, blue-green testing when they're making new releases. They can make a canary release and direct traffic from, say, your developers to the new version of the application. At the same time, Kubernetes is delivering the live service to your end users. And we'll, we'll, we'll demo a little bit of that um, when I get onto the demo. Typically, in front of the ingress controller, you would have some kind of external load balancer. And that can be, as I said, a cloud load balancer, or it might be an F5 big IP. Uh, we have virtual additions that you can deploy into cloud environments, or it could be another Nginx. So um, in, I'm going to show you a bit of a demo which shows you um, an Nginx ingress controller managing uh, Kubernetes workloads inside AKS. And in front of that, I'm going to have another Nginx Plus instance that is being managed by the Nginx controller that, that Richard mentioned. Um, and that's going to manage the actual configuration of that external load balancer. And it's going to use a Kubernetes operator to actually in, interface the two, um, the, the scalability of the ingress controller inside Kubernetes with the dynamic configuration of the load balancer running outside of Kubernetes. Um, so just to if we move on here, so typically when you deploy into Kubernetes, you have a number of different namespaces. So for every project or microservices you might deploy, you'll typically deploy a namespace, and then that is a, a you know a, a ring fenced um, resource that you can you can then provide to uh, the project team, and they can deploy services into that ring fenced section. Uh, what generally happens is when, when this uh, deployment has been configured and set up, inside that resource, they will create an ingress resource or a virtual server uh, resource, which is the Nginx um, extended version of ingress. And that was then consumed by a shared ingress uh, controller that manages traffic into that namespace and other projects that might be running within that environment. So in terms of how controller fits in, <clears throat> um, generally within Kubernetes, you manage uh, ingress resources and all of the, the, the services that you deploy within Kubernetes using the Kubernetes API. So they're, they're, the, the Kubernetes API server is, um, is, is you know, the, the source of truth. It manages everything that is deployed within Kubernetes. But we can take an operator and we can actually pick up Kubernetes resources and push them up to our Nginx controller to help manage the load balancing across your Kubernetes cluster. And this kind of joins the, the two worlds together, if you like, the, the, the internal Kubernetes cluster um, that's managed by, by Kubernetes with the external service that is then going to load balance over that service. And by using an operator and custom resources, you can actually um, tie in the Nginx controller API and have your, uh, your whole estate managed uh, from within your Kubernetes environment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that uh, in a few minutes. Um, and by doing that, you basically get the ability to control the end-to-end -end traffic flow from your external clients through your load balancer into the ingress controller and then to the application all from within the Kubernetes environment. An Nginx controller is managing, um, again, with role-based access control, which users can actually publish the services to, to the external, um, to, to external uh, the internet or whatever. And it will also collect analytics from that uh, Nginx Plus instance running outside of the environment too. Okay, so I hope, I hope uh, that made sense to everyone, and we're gonna we're gonna have a go at, at doing that. So if I come to my uh, web server now, my uh, browser, sorry. So this is my uh, controller that's managing my external Nginx instances, and if I come into services, I can see that I've got a couple of environments running at the moment. I have one, uh, I have an application running Grafana, and another application running Prometheus. And in here, we can actually see this is my Prometheus environment, which is collecting uh, statistics from everything deployed in Kubernetes. And I have a Grafana dashboard that I've built that is um, connecting into that Prometheus instance and recording statistics from that. So at the moment, the, the stats recorded here are, are literally um, 
all of the, the requests from this dashboard to Prometheus running through the controller and into to, to Kubernetes. What I'm going to be deploying is I'm going to deploy an example website uh, called watchies.nginx.demo and I'm going to deploy an API as well. And these are going to use two parts of controller. So I'm going to deploy an application with some load balancing components, and then I'm going to deploy an API as well using our API management functionality, along with uh, an identity provider to actually manage access to that API. So if we go to um, Kubernetes now, so I hope that's you can all read that OK. Let's just zoom in on a couple of these windows. OK, so in here I have a, a bunch of manifests. So you can configure Kubernetes in many ways, um, but you essentially talk to a Kubernetes API. Uh, and in here I have a number of components that I am going to deploy. So I have a namespace already um, called, uh, I think it's called Cheese Demo. And this is running various services. So inside here I have an API some API containers running, I have a database running, and I have some web servers running. I also have a, a Nginx operator, and this is and this is going to actually consume custom resources and use the controller API to push those resources into uh, my controller configuration. And then controller is going to manage that external Nginx instance that, that I spoke about. So if we go back and, and look in controller, you can actually see that um, controller is actually API centric, uh, sorry, application centric and API first. So everything we do in controller is done through an API. So th this web interface here, I can come in and I can edit um, any of these components. And when I do so, um, I can fill in the, this nice form and it's all you know, very user friendly. But once you've finished and you hit the submit button, what this does is it actually calls the underlying API. And this is the um, and this is the API call that it's going to make. So the APIs include metadata, stuff like name, um, display name, description and tags. And it also has a desired state. And the desired state is a declarative API. So you're saying this is how I want this service to be deployed and the configuration I want on it. Um, and controller will then work to make to, to, to bring the current state in line with what you want your desired state to be. So it's a declarative API and it, it uses an eventually consistent model. So it will continually retry um, to bring the service into line with what you've asked for. So it's very similar to the way Kubernetes works in, in that respect. So I'm just going to get rid of those. Um, <clears throat> so this is the two services I have on here at the moment. And an application is obviously um, an application, and that is made up of various components, which are essentially endpoints, uh, which can be, you know, uh, one might be an API, one might be a website, one might be a um, some kind of business to business component. And these are all deployed in environments which are linked to our role based access control system. And then they are delivered to gateways. So I've got two gateways for Prometheus and Grafana at the moment, and some certificates and and everything that's deployed currently is for managing those two services. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start creating some additional components. So I'm creating components inside Kubernetes. Um, so sorry. So. KCA is just an alias and it's going to execute cube control in the namespace cheese demo and it's going to apply um, the, these particular elements. So application is a custom resource and that's going to create the application and then the operator is going to pick that up and it's going to connect to the API of my controller and create a new application for me. So within a few seconds we should see that appear in our list over here and there we go. So, so this is it's been deployed. It's called Watchies App in the Azure prod environment, and its description is an application deployed by Kubernetes. And if we look at what I sent to the Kubernetes API, it is literally uh, display name Watchies App, an application deployed by Kubernetes. So I'm just going to create the rest of the, the elements of this application now. So I have a certificate, 
which will take some secret data out of the Kubernetes secret store and post it to our certs manager in controller. It will also, um, so I'll kick that off. It will also then create a gateway uh, for our website. So again, this is uh, 50, I think. And then we have to create the components. So I'm going to create um, a Watchies component. So uh, one of the things that Nginx Plus provides uh, is above the open source version is a web application firewall. So I'm actually going to apply. I have a couple of different options I can use here. I'm going to use the, the component that enables the WAF. Um, so I'll show you that in a second. When we come back to the controller UI, you can see that the uh, Watchies gateway has been deployed with the uh, endpoints it's it's going to manage and the certificate has been deployed as well. Also under apps, if we go into the application, we can now see our component and it's still in the process of configuring. Uh, so once that's done, we should be able to come over here and by reloading, we can see our, our website. So that's all been deployed. So those services were, were deployed into Kubernetes and then I use Kubernetes to actually manage an external service um, by using uh, by interfacing the controller with the Kubernetes API. So that kind of gives you an end to end uh, configuration. Um, I, I deployed the, uh, the the service using uh, a WAF as well. So this is the manifest for that service. Um, so you can see here, I have that desired state that I pointed out in the API, and this is our declarative API. And I've literally enabled the WAF by, by setting these values. Um, so in the YAML, I have a security section with a WAF, and I, I've enabled the, the WAF uh, for various services. I have a monitor on there, and I also have um, some URIs. The actual workload groups were populated from Kubernetes based on uh, which ingress controllers we're running in Kubernetes. And if we look in controller, uh, we should be able to see uh, in the component, we'll see that the actual back end, the back ends are three, um, three node ports on my services where, on my AKS cluster, where I have ingress controllers running. If I were to scale that ingress controller layer, then uh, the the controller would pick that up automatically and, and change where it's directing its traffic. So, this, so that's just a simple website been deployed. Um, now, if I was going to deploy uh, a new version of the application, so a common DevOps requirement is to be able to route traffic within Kubernetes to different versions of the container. And that's something we can do uh, within the Kubernetes ingress controller. So if I, if I show you this manifest here, um, you can see that we have uh, so, so inside this manifest we have two two backend services one watches web and one watches web version two and then within the routing section we have the ability um, so by default we're going to send application data to web version one but we also have a condition so Austin Powers is one of our our lead developers and he wants to test version two. So we can check for the Austin Powers cookie. And if its value is yeah, baby, yeah, then we can route it to web uh, to web version two instead of version one. Okay, so at the moment, clearly I, I'm going to version one of the app. And if we check um, in Grafana, we can see that actually I am using web version one in all of my requests. But what I'm gonna do now is, is if I, whoops, if I come back to my website, um, I can inject a cookie and pretend to be Austin Powers. So my cookie name is Austin and the value needs to be yeah, baby, yeah. And if I save that and then refresh, oops, we get the version two of the application. And you can see in version two, we actually have the ability to add additional products into our cheese API, which would be great if our cheese API was running, um, which it is. 
Um, I was expecting that to be down actually. Um, but um, it's running, but it's not actually being managed by an API gateway. It's just being pushed through the the default um, the, the default ingress controller and the default service. What we want to do is we actually want to define that API within uh, controller so that we can add some additional protections. And we're going to do that now. So up until now, I've been managing the uh, deployments using Kubernetes and Kubernetes resources, which have been then pushed out to controller. Uh, over here, I'm going to, I'm on the same box, but I'm this time I'm going to deploy um, the components using Ansible. So I have a playbook here, which rather than going through Kubernetes, talks to the controller API directly. So if I do deploy application, this is actually going. Oh, sorry. So if I run my Ansible playbook, I'm going to deploy uh, uh, an API to my um, controller. I'm going to also create a, some identity an ident identity provider. Sorry. So I've deployed the API and the API management in controller takes an open API spec, uh, also known as a swagger definition file. And it imports that and it can see the elements that you have within the API. It can take any documentation you might include in there and make available through a developer portal. Um, and it can also, also publish those endpoints. So what I'm doing is I've created the, I've uploaded my swagger definition to controller. I've published various endpoints in the Azure prod environment within uh, my Watchies application. I've created some Watchies um, admin keys as an identity provider. So this is a pre-shared key type approach. Um, we can also integrate with OpenID Connect and uh, Jot authentication with OAuth2. And I've also added some more components into my Watchies app. So you can see I have a cheese read, a cheese write, and a links component. So if I if I um, come into my API now, um, again this is what you saw before. But now if I reload a few times, I get a four a four two nine response because now I have a configuration that is actually rate shaping and protecting my API. Um, within the API, we have various cheeses and beers. Um, and pickles. So uh, within within the within any of these sections, we can attempt to add uh, a new service. Um, but the uh, the controller configuration has actually required authorization if you attempt to make a write to the API, and that is protected um, by via these uh, these pre shared keys that that I mentioned. So what I'm going to do. Um, oh, you can see, sorry, that uh, V2 was used when I when I sent the the cookie. So if I come back to my version two of the website, this is actually designed to be able to uh, push configuration into the API. <clears throat> so if I use this new uh, version two component to post data, um, I get an error if I send it ordinarily because, as I, as I've said, it needs a, a pre-shared key in order to gain access. So this is the pre-shared key. And if I include that in my post and post again, this time you can see EDAM has been added. And if we go to uh, the cheeses in the API, you can see that it appears in the response data from the API as well. So I've, I've deployed a new application from Kubernetes. I've configured components, again, using Kubernetes uh, resources. And I've also published an API um, through the controller and protected it with both a rate limiting configuration and also protected the right uh, access to the API uh, using a, a, an API key. Um, so we, we can, we could, you know, as beer is, uh, is popular today, we could actually post the beer type. So I have, what do I have? Um, I have Shipyard, American Pale Ale, and it, I'm guessing it's from the USA. I just put 
tasty in as a description. I should have, and then if I post that, um, that is now posted to the beer section of the API, and we can happily go and view that as well. There we go, ID3. Um, so that's kind of the quick demo I wanted to show you today. Um, we do obviously collect statistics from all of these systems, as I said. So I can go into um, Azure Prod, for instance. I should have run a load test while I was doing this, but never mind. And I can look at traffic for like the last five minutes, say, and then I can split it out by, I don't know, component, and we can see um, the different components. So uh, the website, uh, that links page, and then read and and write elements of the API as well. And we get to see workload latency, time to first byte, latency between Nginx and the back end, as well as latency between Nginx and the client. And I can view this from various different levels. So if I know, for instance, that if I've identified that maybe the API is running slowly, I can actually come into the API element and get those same kind of analytics uh, just for that part of the of the service. And, and I can split it down by various different um, components. So I might use the URI in this case. Um, again, not a lot of data has been sent, um, but you can see the, the latency and stuff for that. Um, so I think, I think that's all I wanted to show you, really. Um, shall I hand back to you, Richard? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so um, ho hopefully that was um, uh, intriguing and interesting. Um, we've got some follow up, which we'd be delighted to share with you some um, sort of online e, e documents that we typically hide behind a wall and we make you go through hoops to get hold of that. But if you like to contact me, I'll put my contact details in the chat window. Uh, feel, feel free to reach out and uh, we're happy to provide you with these ebooks. They're a good source of learning. There's a lot of independent collateral in there as well, which uh, helps with, uh, with knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer. And uh, we'd be delighted to help um, if you have any challenges or problems. Um, with that, I guess that's it, Sarah, from our side. We're bang on the hour, so we're, we're bang to time, which is good. If there's any questions, happy to take them. But um, back to you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, there's no questions in the chat, but has anybody got any questions for Richard or Mark while they're here? Uh, yeah, let me post it, my uh, my email address in the chat window, and then please um, please ping me, and uh, we'll happily provide you with uh, with a couple of the ebooks. Also, if you if you go online, I'll give you the Nginx website. You'll be able to see some of the other content that we have, and again, um, we're happy to to service that without you having to jump through the hoops. So that'd be fine. So, cool. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Appreciate the, the time and the opportunity. Sarah, thanks for arranging this for us. Um, we enjoyed it. I'd say cheers. Cheers to you all. <laughs> and um, hopefully we'll get to come back when we're allowed to be in the same room together. And uh, Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Cool. Thank you. Um, in tonight's agenda, I've kind of built in a uh, kind of round the table. If anybody wants to talk about anything that they're doing, discuss any problems. I know it's a bit weird that we're all virtual and we're used to doing this um, in person and it's a bit awkward. But if anybody wants to have a bit of a chat right now, happy to do that. If not, we can just jump to the quiz and then I can let you all go and enjoy the sunshine that we seem to be having in the UK. <laughs> Okay, have you all gone shy on me tonight? I was pouring a beer, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we can go straight to the quiz if that's what everybody wants to do. That's not a problem. Um, I can do that if you give me a sec. So you should be seeing on your screen um, the Kahoot 
kind of details. Hopefully you all know how to do this by now, but if not, grab a web browser, grab your mobile phone, go to the kahoot.it website, put in that pin number, and then we can um, start the quiz. Um, the quiz is a small app where the question will appear on the screen here, and then um, you can um, answer on your screen on your whatever device you've logged into. The questions are based, you get points on whether you've answered the question correctly or whether you've answered it quickly or not as well. So it's about being quick and getting it right. Um, and as I said, at the top of the meeting, we have prizes. Um, so we have, the names are very weird. Anyway, the um, prizes for the, the winner of this quiz are a Logitech mouse and a Razor mouse map. I actually kind of virtually picked one up a snake this <laughs> to put on the random names. Okay. Um, I think, is that everybody joined or is everybody trying to still join? Are we all good? I will take silence as we're good to go. So let's start the next one. So we've got 10 questions tonight and like I said, it's about being right and quick. So what Azure storage is designed for file shares? And yep, it's Azure files is dedicated or designed specifically for your files. So Mighty Dragon, whoever that is, is in the lead. This is for double points. What does LRS stand for in terms of Azure storage? And yep, locally redundant storage. Oh, Sturdy Octopus is now in the lead. Again, double points. How many meetup has the Glasgow Azure user group had, including this one? See who's been paying attention. And yep, tonight is our 19th meetup. So again, thank you for everybody for your support. And Sturdy Octopus is still in lead. Double points again. What new storage type went generally available? I think people mentioned this. I don't think she's. Seen it. Yep, it was the GeoZone redundant storage, which is so not easy to say. I'm glad I haven't had a proper drink tonight. Sturdy Octopus is still in the lead. So, which Azure Migrate feature? Re recently with Jen. It's been out for quite a while, but it recently has a great win. So yeah, we, we recently um, announced that 
important your server assessment details um, was available in Azure Migrate and that's where you take like a Excel spreadsheet that you've got of your server names you know memory RAM and um, CPU IP address and then upload it into the Azure Migrate portal and it gives you an assessment back it's great for those that um, can't maybe put the appliance in and download that data maybe in a shared data center or have security ho hoops that you have to jump through that's really super cool um, Sturdy Octopus is still there. So we've got true or false. Soft delete protects blob data from being accidentally or erroneously modified or deleted. Is that true or false? And it's true. Number seven, what is the Azure CAF? At Microsoft, we love an acronym. So what does CAF stand for? And yep, it's our cloud adoption framework. Oh, creative lines overtaken now. So what Azure service uses the Azure Connected Machine Agent MSI. This is a preview service, so we'll see who's been paying attention. <laughs> And yep, it's the Azure Arc. So the Azure Connected Machine Agent MSI um, is the agent that you install on non-Azure machines, and you're able to use some of the Azure services around that. So Creative Line still in the lead. Question number nine: Just-in-time access is available on the Azure Security Center free tier. Is that true or false? And that's false. Um, you actually have to go up to the standard tier, um, I believe, to get just-in-time access. It's not in the free. Creative Line is still in the lead, but Fearless Badger seems to be coming up behind. Question number 10. A user deleted an Azure VM six weeks ago, and you need to find out who did that. What service would you use to do that? So, yep, you would use activity logs to try and um, troubleshoot that and find out who the culprit was. So here we are, who's won? So in third place, Sturdy Octopus, well done. Fearless Badger was number two. And the winner tonight is Creative Line. So well done. Um, I will post my contact details in the chat window. Please reach out to me and we can get your plans. Um, so that was for tonight, unless anybody has any questions or chat or feedback. Um, thank you again, everybody, for attending. It's really appreciative. I know virtual is a bit weird um, and wonderful. Um, but thank you again for supporting us. Um, I put my contact details in the chat window for the winner to um, reach out to me. And I've also put a small survey. If before you can log off, you can complete that survey just to give us some feedback on how you're enjoying the meetups, what topics you want to cover in the next one. We are hopeful that we will do a meetup in August. Um, it's probably going to be virtual with the way things are unfortunately going, um, but I'll be releasing more details about that over the coming weeks and who we've got to speak at that. So. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers and our sponsors. And yeah, everybody stay safe and um, I'll hopefully catch you again soon. Thank you. Cheers, yeah, good stuff, guys. Thanks, Sarah. Cheers, Nick. Yep. Bye. Bye.